Logan's Run by William F. Nolan and George Clayton Johnson. Part 10. 4. He knows the girl is on black now, a runner. But the quarry has vanished again beyond Crazy Horse. He checks the board in Rapid City. It does not help him. The follower remains dark. He is certain that Logan and the girl must break cover soon. When, he, when they do, he will be ready. He will be there to intercept them. Afternoon. Jess lay unconscious in a pale square of sunlight next to her damaged machine. One cheek was scraped raw where she had skidded along the black asphalt. The wound on her thigh still pulsed blood. She didn't hear the soft footsteps or the voices that surrounded her. Fourteen bright eyes peered down. Oh, pretty, pretty. Seven tiny moppets and plink pink play rompers drew back in alarm as the girl stirred. Jess moaned, lapsed back into unconsciousness. The children bent over the still figure. Wondering, they felt her hair, her soft lips, the long lashes of her closed eyes. What is it? It's a people. Oh, so big. People tired. They clucked together, deciding that Jess should be in a crib. They tugged and lift and pulled her towards the crib room. Fourteen bright eyes peered down. Jess lay on her side in a small crib, knees tucked under her chin. The crib had sensed her hurt and ministered to her, closing her wounds with synthoskin. She slept deeply. The eyes never left her. Dakota State's Industrial Nursery, Unit K. Beneath the sign, Logan reconnoitered the gray metal mesh fence. Twice as tall as a man and capped with a triple strand of microwire, these gossamer threads could chop off fingers under the weight of a climber. Beyond the fence, far out on the flat surface of the nursery playground, he could see the wreckage of Jess Jessica's devil stick. Apparently she was inside somewhere, perhaps already in the hands of the auto governesses. Other runners had tried to hide in these vast institutions, but each auto governess was programmed to sound an alarm, and if you could avoid the robots, there were always other, the other children conditioned and hypnotaped against invaders. But I've got to try and find her. Oops. He had to walk a full mile along the fence perimeter before he found the tree. It angled up and inward, one of its branches thrust out towards the wire. Logan climbed the tree, inching out as far along the branch as he dared. He hung there, six feet ahead of him, and down, were the deadly strands of microwire. He began to swing himself back and forth, gathering momentum. If he'd struck the wires, they'd slice him like cheese. At the height of a swing, he let go, twisting his body in the air. Logan hit the ground safely, rolled, and came up in a crouch. Silence. No alarms. He crossed the wide asphalt towards the looming bulk of the nursery. At its fortress flank, he paused to orient himself. He'd grown up in a place like this. The hypno classes would be in the west wings, the dorms to the left. He was now outside the infant wards. Less chance of being discovered if he entered here. High up the brick building face was a bank of windows. Logan began to climb, clinging to the irregular surface. A foot slipped. He regained his balance and continued. The first window was locked. He spidered along a narrow ledge, feeling the strain pulling at his arm muscles. The next window was unlocked but jammed. He struggled to budget. The glass panel grated inward. Logan crawled through, dropped to the floor, and stood listening. He was in a storage area. Where was Jess? She could be anywhere in the sprawl of buildings. She could be hurt and dying in a corridor, or under a conveyor, or hidden in a locker space. Or maybe she wasn't here at all. The silence encouraged him. If Jess were here, at least she hadn't been discovered as yet. He crossed the room and eased open the door. Distantly, he heard the hum and buzz of classrooms in use. He checked the hall. Deserted. He moved to the next door. The dot symbol told him it was a playroom. It was not activated. The vibro balls were boxed and motionless, no longer bouncing themselves in puzzle patterns from the walls. The talk puppets were stacked and speechless. The echo boards were silent. No sign of Jess here. He closed the door. The next chamber was also quiet. The delivery room. Logan checked the moveways. He stared in fascination at the hourglass, at the phosphorescent crystals in the thick globe, which gave each infant his birthright, the radioactive time flower. He stared at his own hand, blinking red, black, red, black. He'd received his crystal in a room like this. It had embedded the flower in his right palm, and the crystal had decayed on schedule, in the same way the cesium atom decays in a radium clock. 
turning the stigmata inexorably from yellow to blue to red, and now, soon, to black. Logan passed through the room to a long corridor. Had Jess gone in this direction? The search seemed helpless, but he could not abandon it. Not until he was forced to. A whirring noise. A sound Logan had heard often in his childhood. The auto governess. He jerked open a door to his right, dodged inside. The door swung closed. The interior was dark and warm. My own, my precious, his mother said. A softness enveloped him. My little one, my sweet, said the love room. Its voice was a crooning, smoothing music. There, there, said the room. Logan attempted to struggle, but the room held him fast in tender embrace, stroked him. It pressed him gent it pressed him against its warm great warm bosom and rocked him gently, rhythmically. My dove, my darling, my precious love. But I can't, Logan said wildly. His mother held him close. I can't stay here. I've got to sleep said the room softly. Need and emotional hunger flooded through Logan in a great wave. Mother loves you, loves you, loves you, sang the room. No, cried Logan. I've got to sleep, said the room. I've got to sleep, insistently, lovingly. Go to sleep, sighed Logan. He slept. In crib room L-16, during her hourly inspection, auto governess K-110 discovered a sleeping woman. The auto governess calmly rolled into the corridor and activated the invader alarm. Bells. Sirens. Jess awoke in panic, leaped from the small crib, and began to run. The nursery defended its children. Doors slammed. Gates closed. Trams and roofways halted. Crib covers snapped down like turtle shells. Barriers sprung through slotted floors, sealing off each wing. Invaders. Repel. Protect. Defend. The door of the love room was wrenched open. Logan was there. Jess, this way. In the alarm din, they fled along corridors, crowed with, crowded with curious children. An otter to governess rolled at them, clucking. Logan disabled it with a savage heel blow. They slid under a descending barrier, whipped through a closing door, avoided a handler machine. They clattered down to the first floor as the building entrance was sliding shut along its lubricated tracks. Faster, Logan yelled. They cleared the massive slide door a split second before it locked home. The edge of the door wrapped Logan's shoulder, knocking him off stride, but they were out of the building. They sprinted across the playground for the main gate. It was closed. Logan broke into the glass control booth, smashed the panel, and jerked down the release switch. The gate swung open. A robo-guard tried to stop them, but Logan evaded it, grabbed Jessica by the arm, and cut into a ditch. They disappeared down a weak choked bar ditch that angled into the woods. The Rapid City concourse was jammed with citizens when they arrived on the maze platform. Logan had retrieved his gun, and it was kept safely out of sight against his ribs. Jess kept her right hand fisted to conceal her char flower. Still, Logan knew, the scanners would pick them up if they tried to board the maze car. Stay back here, close to the wall, he told Jess. He sifted through the crowd. A ruddy-faced man bumped him. The man's arms were full of souvenirs from the western states. A triangular banner extending from his collar proclaimed, Cheyenne Frontier Days, Letterbuck. Perched on top of the heap of packages was a tiny outhouse carved from polished redwood. When the citizen bumped Logan, the outhouse fell to the platform. Logan picked it up, put it back on the pile. Thanks, citizen. Yahoo! Yahoo! replied Logan, forcing a smile. He reached the scanner box, opened it casually in the manner of repairman. Reaching in, he shorted out the unit. Returning to Jess, he heard her towards the boarding slots. She stumbled, put out a hand to steady herself. In that brief gesture, she revealed her black palm flower, and a woman on the edge of the crowd screamed, Runner! A ripple of excitement, shouting voices. Shock. A man was about to enter a maze car. Logan thrust him back, and they leaped aboard. The angry crowd dropped away behind them and was lost as the car burrowed into the long tunnel. The continent rushed under and over and around them. Logan knew the dangers. Unless DS blundered, and DS never blundered. There would already be operatives at the Rapid City platform checking their departure. Within seconds, DS would know exactly which car they were on, which tunnel they were in. Dispatchers would alert all units along the route. The car suddenly faltered, slowed, slotted into a siding. They've stopped us, said Logan. Out. Where are we? asked Jest. No questions. Hurry. As the hatch opened and they made their exit, Logan caught a sublim flicker on a maze car viewscreen. It was what they always said, duty, 
don't run. Union artillery batteries were destroying Fredericksburg when Logan and Jess reached ground level. Snipers had fired on the federal troops preparing to cross the Rappahannock River, and General Burnside had ordered his cannon to level the town. He would then occupy Fredericksburg and advance into the hills to clear out the Confederate stronghold. It was a foolhardy plan, this direct frontal assault on an impregnable position, and Burnside had been warred against it, but he'd refused to alter his decision. His battle plan would be carried out despite the odds. He was determined to wipe out the rebels on their own grand ground and give the North a great victory. Now the pontoon boats were being readied for the river crossing. Blue-coated officers on horseback were directing the operation. Ponderous wagons and heavy brass artillery pieces were being rolled onto the wooden boats. Burnside studied the south shore through a pair of field glasses. A church steeple tottered and fell under the barrage. A tall brick structure folded into rubble. Burnside lowered the glasses, rubbing at his long black whiskers. He looked about twenty. We'll give those Johnny Rebs a real whoopin' right enough, he declared. They'll remember this day. The general's aide looked concerned. I hear Lee is on the slope with Longstreet, and Stonewall Jackson commands the right flank. It's going to be extremely difficult, sir. Burnside snorted. War is never easy, Major. You do what you must for your country. The aide saluted and returned to his men. Ambrose E. Burnside was a robot an android, built to the exact specifications of the famed Civil War officer. His mass of blue-clad androids would engage gray-clad androids for a day and a night in the Battle of Fredericksburg in a compressed recreation of the bloody slaughter of 1862, when more than 12,000 men died on these Virginia slopes. Field pieces would flash from a hidden embrasures. Breakaway buildings would collapse on schedule. Cannonballs would strike into ranks of breakaway robots who would lose arms and legs and heads in brutally realistic fashion. The snow-patched ground would be stained with crimson fluids. Logan and Jess edged into the pack of excited tourists and Virginia citizenry crowding the view areas. Duty, a loudspeaker blared above the din. That's what you'll see here today, citizens. Loyalty. Courage. The willingness to die for one's country in order to preserve it. The Civil War was fought by 17- and 18-year-olds, men willing to die for their cause. They did not question their duty or flinch for them in the face of death. They sacrificed themselves willingly, gloriously. Now, watch them charge, citizens. In this heroic battle, shown to you as it happened 254 years ago. And remember, there were no runners at Fredericksburg. Jess looked at the terrain facing them. Artificially created fog cloaked the ground. Cannon added a base Rumble to the sharp snap of musketry. The crowd rose up in gouts as shot and ball plowed it. Silently, Logan guided Jess towards the river. A deep drainage ditch led to the tents of Burnside's camp, and they began to crawl along this, away from the view, view area. The ditch angled around to the rear of the encampment. Logan knew they didn't have to worry about any of the androids giving out alarm. Each robot soldier was programmed to play its assigned part in the battle. They clambered up the drainage bank and ducked under the canvas flap of a Union tent. Two perfectly formed androids were standing motionless inside, ready to step from the tent when their circuits commanded them. Their blank 16-year-old faces were frozen. Logan struck them to the ground and began to strip off their clothing. Put this on, he said, tossing Jess a federal uniform. Logan buttoned the blue tunic, stuffing the gun into it. He looped a canteen around his shoulder, picked up a long musket. Jess also took a musket. In the soiled uniform with a Union cap pulled over her hair, she could pass as a soldier so long as they stayed well back from the view areas. Now stick close to me, he said, and do what I do. A bugle sounded the call to arms. Logan and Jess joined the Grand Army of the Potomac. They climbed into one of the slab-sided boats, sharing the craft with a dozen other bluecoats steering its passage across a shallow river. They scrambled up the mud bank into Fredericksburg and moved cautiously through the gutted town. Broken-backed buildings smoked in ruin. The crackle of musketry filled the air. Metal bees hummed. Hill cannon, hill cannon belched bronze thunder. As they walked, the churned mud of the streets sucked at their boots. More bugles, the rattle of drums. Burnside was preparing his assault. On the far right, blue ranks were faltering under the guns of Stonewall Jackson. They faced Marier's Heights, rising up in a steepening incline from a wide plain splattered with artificial snow. The heights were manned by the crack Washington artillery of New Orleans, pride of the South. Robert Lee E. Lee was up there with the Greys, giving them his strength, and the entrenched Confederates had mounted some 250 field pieces to rake the slope below. 
to the left. The holiday concourse was jammed with spectators. Bright tunics, flags, and the ocean roar of happy people. A darkness there. A black tunic. D.S. Francis. Had he seen them, guessed at their destination? Was he, even now, raising his gun to homer them? Logan turned back to the hill, pulled his cap lower. The girl's face was gray. She looked at Logan helplessly. She pointed off to the right. We have to get across the battlefield, to the other side. They'll see us. Not if we move up the slope with Burnside's men. Once past the wall over Marius Heights, we'll be all right. There's a maze tunnel I used to play in as a boy. They don't use it much since they built New Fredericksburg and reconverted the area. Come on, lads, yelled an android officer near Logan. Let's show the Rebs our steel. In a wash of fife and drum and bugle and bright regimental flags, the boys in blue marched out in columns of four, muskets forward, a tide of bayonets moving up. Keep your head lowered, he told Jess, and stay out of the depressions. That's where the cannons are programmed to hit. They were a third of the way up in ordered rank, and the hill guns were quiet, getting the range, letting the sheep march close to the slaughter. Burnside's blunder, they called it for two centuries after. Burnside the fool, the pompous clown with his mutton-chop whiskers, sending his troops to certain death in a vain bid for personal glory. Little wonder that Lincoln replaced him after Fredericksburg. A pulsing silence. The cannons emptied their iron throats. Inferno. Logan pressed, Jess pressed close to Logan, inching up the snowed slope as the withering storm of canister exploded around them. Androids screamed, dropped muskets, pitched forward. Robot horses pawed the air, gushed crimson. Bugles ceased in mid-cry. Marie's Hill was a tumult of shrieking metal death. Don't falter now, cried a halt to the lieutenant behind them. Forward, for Lincoln and the Union. Hurrah, hurrah. A cannonball cut him in half. Just ahead of them, concealed behind a stretch of uneven stone wall fronting Sunken Road, a contingent of sharpshooting Georgians and North Carolinians rose up to pour a hot hail of musket fire into the still advancing Federals. The lines were falling back. As Logan reached the base of the wall at Sunken Road, a musket shot dropped him to his knees. He was momentarily breathless, but alive. The canteen across his chest had absorbed the ball. Artillery crashed through Oak Woods. Fleeced smoke from hill cannon laced the sky mingling with this curtain of ground fog. Where was Jess? Logan scanned the slope for sign of her. Near him, a gray-clad figure was shaking a fist and mount, shouting in mock triumph. Skedaddle, you bluebellies! Back to your holes! Eow! Several Confederates had fallen behind the wall, but other robots had filed in along the barrier. Logan was ignored as he stripped off his uniform, discarding it along with his musket. The gallop of an advancing horse, a stern-faced man on a white stallion, saber in hand, bearded, uniformed, and slender. Fine, boys, fine, boomed Robert E. Lee. There'll be extra rations for all when this day's done. His voice was considerably amplified in order to reach the crowd in the few areas. He galloped back down the line. The attack had been completely broken now, and the blues were in full rout. Then, clearly, Logan saw Jess, far down the slope. The girl was struggling against a tide of moving androids. Caught up in a knot of retreating figures, she was swept back down the long hill towards the viewing stands back towards Francis.